Welcome to Basic Black. Some of you are joining us on our broadcast and others of you are joining us on our digital platforms. I'm Callie Crossley, host of Under the Radar 89.7. Tonight, the 60th anniversary of the March on Washington and the new Bay State Banner. Next month marks the 60th anniversary of the historic March on Washington. In August 1963, civil rights organizers, including the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., led the march for jobs and freedom, drawing a nonviolent crowd of 250,000. Reverend King delivered his now iconic I Have a Dream speech, and the march helped pass the 1964 Civil Rights Act. That inspired Boston businessman Mel Miller to found the Bay State Banner newspaper, focusing on the interests and concerns of greater Boston's African-American community. For 58 years, Miller, as editor and publisher, led the banner until recently, when he sold it to the Boston-based, black-owned media group Mitchell Stark Enterprises. A look back to the March on Washington at 60 and a look forward to a march to the future by a local black institution. Joining us for this discussion, Ronald Mitchell, co-owner, editor, and publisher, The Bay State Banner. Andre Stark, co-owner and associate publisher, The Bay State Banner. And Glenn Lloyd, executive director, Mill City's Community Investments. Welcome to you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So again, the, the March on Washington's full name is the March for Jobs and Freedom, the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. So thinking about it in that context and looking back, you know, to now from 60 years, Ron, what's your take on what this anniversary means? Well, it's a wonderful anniversary to remind us what black people in America have been through and our struggle for empowerment. But it also reminds us that we still have a tremendously long way to go when you think about, you know, where the balance of economic and equal justice is in our society. Um, Andre, you said that your mom, when you were little, little, took you to a march here in Boston with Reverend King. It was amazing. She revealed that about five years ago and said that she went right down to BU and they were marching on Com Ave. She had me by the hand and she had my sister in her carriage. And she said it was one of the biggest things that ever happened to her in her life. Because she was from Barbados, she spent time over there and she came over here. And that was one of the first iconic moments mm. in her lifetime, besides having us, of course. But uh, she said she had a great time. She got to meet him. She got to meet Mrs. King. And I go, geez, I wish I was older so I could have experienced it just the way you did. Well, now you're older and you can look back to the 60th anniversary of this march. What say you about what it means? I, I think it's, it, it's similar to what Ron mentioned, that it's a, uh, an iconic moment and that it, it tells us as publishers of the paper of how much we have to promote ourselves to reach limits that we haven't even begun to see yet. So it really uh, inspires us to work harder to make sure that everybody is involved in the uplift from that speech. Hmm. And Glenn, your thoughts? Yeah, it's been a long arc of, uh, of us as freedom fighters, right? And I, I, you know, I think we've evolved recently too to really add what I would call the importance of ownership when we talk about freedom. Mm. And I think what we're going to talk today about the importance of us owning our own institutions, which really in this in this society is, is so is so vital. And again, it was jobs and freedom. So Correct. Reverend King was on a mission for about economic justice. So that was a part of the march at that time. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, it makes a perfect linkage to our conversation about new ownership of the Bay State Banner. But I want to just put this uh, information out there. There were 40 black newspapers at the time of the Civil War. Today, there are over 200 black-owned newspapers and many other black-owned media companies. Of course, the Bay State Banner is one. How do you see yourself on the spectrum of those newspapers and being the new owners of the Bay State Banner? We're going to get to how you got to be that. But just overall, thinking about yourself as part of that group, Ron. Well, it's really an honor to be part of that group mm -hmm. because, as Glenn was mentioning, ownership is important. It's really important for us as black people to tell our stories and be in charge of our message. When you're not in charge of your message, it always gets co-opted. So I think the most important thing for us is to continue to tell the true stories about our community, and ownership is the key. When you don't own something, you don't control it. Mm -hmm. Despite what other people tell you, no matter how much they want to, you know, encourage you and say, oh, well, you know, we're going to do your stuff, you can be part of ours. When you own it, you can control it, you can make sure real journalism is, is put on the paper. And, you know, that's really the key, telling the truth about our people. Okay. For you, Andre? 
Um, I think one of the, the three tenets of the paper that we want to focus on are um, political... Just, before, before you go there, I just want to know, boy, how, do, how do you see the paper fitting in in this 200-plus black-owned newspapers at this moment? I think it's, it's mm -hmm. a vital resource for the community. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I see people all the time coming up to me and telling me how much they want the banner. I had another person who said uh, that they nobody nobody buys anything from his his store unless the banner's there. Mm. And I hear that all the time. I went to Brockton and somebody said, can you bring some papers down here? We, we want to hear about the news that's happening. So it's a vital resource and will continue to be a vital resource past when we, we uh, are gone. Mm -hmm. Because everybody wants to know, they don't trust some of the other local outlets. And that is one of the reasons that gives us an incentive to carry on. Mm -hmm. Well, that means that Mel built quite a legacy of trust um, in the newspaper. So how do you see it? Really, mm -hmm. it, it's trust in, I think, the, the quality. And we've mm -hmm. got to say that when you list all the other you know, black papers across the country, I think the banner, I think, is, is top of the list in terms of the content. I mean, they did really do some hard journalism happening mm -hmm. here, even down to the graphic and the design. I think Mel and his team have done a, a really good job representing us well, okay. uh, locally and, and regionally and nationally. Well, let's start with you then on the path to owner, the new path, the path to new ownership. Um, as we said, Mel was there for nearly 60 years, and I understand, Glenn Lloyd, you had a hand in getting Ron Mitchell to think about being the new owner of the Bay State Banner. A quiet hand. We don't like to publicize it too much. <laughs> <laughs> but I think for, you know, in my new position running a community development finance institution, this is an example of how local capital can really be put to use in a, in a real way. And, and this was, this was a, a complicated deal. It was, mm -hmm. a, it, was a, it was an acquisition. You had a, you know, a founder who needed to be properly succeeded. And, uh, and Mel's, as we all know, mm -hmm. you know, tough shoes to fill. And um, when Ron and Audrey came along, and it, 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 was, it was a great match. And we were able to you know, pull into our toolbox the right type of capital uh, to make this acquisition uh, work to a point where you know, you know, newspapers need a little extra buffer too, kind of coming, running out of the gate. And, and also Ron and team played an important role of also raising some capital too, which they'll talk about. So it was really a, a village effort to really to make this uh, acquisition come to fruition. So just a little bit of explanation because uh, the deal has been described by you as your first equity deal. And I'm not sure many of us know what that means. So if you can give us a one sentence about what that means. <laughs> one sentence, <laughs> yeah. So t there's two, typically two types of capital, mm -hmm. and so debt, we all mostly know debt, like our mortgages, we've got to pay back on time. So or, that's you know, loans and that, stuff. That's loans and stuff. Mm -hmm. So we had debt into this deal also. Mm -hmm. But equity is a little more unique where we actually, we become partners of ownership gotcha. with, with the team. And so we sit beside the owner, and it's, we call it very patient capital. So this typical deal has both equity and debt. Uh, to make it work. Thank you so much. Now, Ron, um, you were not planning to buy a newspaper. No. You were planning to, <laughs> to retire. And so how do you answer the question, why did you decide to make the purchase? Well, when I thought about it, when it became evident to me in my conversations with Glenn that this was something that I should think about, I had spent 27 years at BZ, you know, as a cameraman, WBZ. editor, WBZ TV mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. in Boston, Channel mm -hmm. 4. And um, as a cameraman and an editor, I was one of the few folks at that station that really fought for stories of color for many years in the beginning. When I first got there, there were actually a lot of black reporters, Sarah and Shaw, Charlie Austin, I'm not Charlie Austin, um, a lot of black reporters. Mm. I won't go through all the names in them, but there were quite a few. And w once the, kind of the, the 90s happened, a, a lot of them left. A lot of them aged out, transferred uh, to other stations, moved up the, the network chain, and then it really didn't, it really, there really wasn't as much motivation to do stories of color in a way that I felt was impactful for our community. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of the broadcast stations were for bleeds it leads, drama. Mm -hmm. And if you do a story to try to get the most amount of clicks or the biggest response, then you alter that story because you always focus on the most emotional part. Mm -hmm. That's not journalism. That's mm -hmm. what I refer to as influencism. Mm -hmm. So as I watched the industry change over time, it became clear to me that I wasn't going to be successful in being able to do the types of stories that I felt were impactful for my community. So when I thought about, you know, okay, I think we're gonna retire, slide out, and do some online stuff and other stuff like that, you know, it was brought to me that, look, the band has been along, around for a long time. You have the network, you have the skills, you have the vision, and this is something that you could do. And not a lot of people have all those combinations. And when you start, when you purchase a company like the banner, you wanna grow it. And you need to have capital to grow it in a mm -hmm. way that you're not instantly paying back for that capital. Right. That's a hard thing. A lot of other papers around the country 
who are black, who have been historically black papers, when you look at that transition, it's hard to find somebody who will come in and give you capital because everybody sees, oh, t newspapers are dying. It's a dying mm -hmm. industry, you know. And it is true yeah. you have to transition to online, but, you know, it's... Um, it was something that I just felt it was my responsibility being a, a Roxbury kid and, and a, a guy from Boston and being in this industry for so long. Okay, so you mission was there and also capabilities because of your background. And you had similar background, Andre, different from Ron's, but you've uh, done documentary filmmaking, so you know media. In fact, you owned a, a media company before you two got together right. with Mitchell Stark Enterprises. So for you, what was the driving force in uh, being a part of this? You know, I, I actually cut my teeth on this program mm -hmm. at WGBH. And it was the first foray into factual media is what I call it. And I had always stayed in that throughout my career and always saw the same people back every day. And finally, I said, hey, when Ron told me about this, I go, geez, you know, I'd like to be part of this because my folks have read the banner since they were around here. And they, uh, my mother would read it twice. Mm -hmm. She'd read it earlier and then right before the new one came out. So I always was familiar with the paper and it was always around. And I wanted to be uh, an, a, a conduit for myself and my knowledge of, of, of the documentary world with the newspaper world. And, all, and both of us have had to relearn because we were digital people and now we're in the newspaper people. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a nice learning experience and it's a nice growing experience. Okay. Now, I want you, Glenn, to talk about why this wasn't a nostalgic investment. We've all spoken about <laughs> Mel's legacy, sure. um, what that this yeah. the Bay State Banner is an institution, why sure. this is That's right. more than a nostalgic investment. That's right. And we've got to be careful about bringing emotion into <laughs> investments, right? right? This, yeah. this is a business transaction. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, again, Mel and team, that's a profitable uh, paper that he had in place. So um, and what I love about what Ron and Audrey said is, is this is about a growth opportunity. So you have, you have a local paper that's gone deep. And with their energy and their team, they really want to take that platform and grow it. And that's what gets a lot of us excited, especially as, as investors. And I think this, this, there's this dilemma, I think, that the media uh, folks are dealing with nowadays, which is this issue around the, the print mm -hmm. and how do we move more towards digital, you know, ca and capturing this, this, you know, the new generation and how they consume news. And I think it's an exciting time. And I think we see some growth happening in some of the, our, I won't mention names, regional papers who are really doing that type of growth right now. And I think the banner can come behind and, and, and really take advantage of what's, what has been left has been a dearth of really high quality local papers when you look at what's happening across the country um, with some of these larger kind of Wall Street money coming in and buying up a lot of these smaller companies and gutting them. So I do think there's a, there's a unique opportunity if managed and executed correctly. Right. And you two have to balance uh, legacy meaning that and cultural habits, okay? So black newspapers, traditionally black communities lack a print edition. Right. And mm -hmm. then you have the other problem of everybody's not all hooked up digitally. But you all are clear about moving. You've got to move digitally in order to be in the future. So how do you balance that? Because that's what's facing you now. Right. Yeah. As mm -hmm. we did our research, we looked at the, mm -hmm. the larger black papers around the country who have been successful in that transition to a more digital platform. Now, as we looked at the audience that were that we reach now, it was important to us to include the younger audience, you know, folks in the late teens, 20s, and 30s, they get their news on their phone. Very few of them even pick up a paper anymore. The banner had a nice website, but there was no marketing for it. There was no push. The other thing that the banner had done was shrunk the different types of news that was in it. They took the sports section away. Mm. You know, they had a lot of different things that really drive readership. Mm -hmm. so, and young readership. And young readership, mm -hmm. especially. So we're spending a lot of time upgrading the website, you know, making it an interactive digital resource for the community. And what I mean by that is, when you come to the website now, not only do you read about that opportunity for a loan or the opportunity for an education, but you also have the links that take you directly to those different sites. You can come on the website and you can find the, the job op application, you can find the loan. And that's really important to us, to making sure that the digital platform is easy, full of resources, and we're pushing it out to a younger audience because that's where they get their news. You can't allow papers to age out. Mm -hmm. And that's the challenge in other markets. How do you keep the readership young? How do you get a younger readership? How do you entice them to come and understand the important issues of the community? Because an uneducated community, 
that's a problem for that's us right. as, as people. What would you add, Andre? Um, I'd add that we just started a new initiative, a uh, black business directory right on the website. Mm -hmm. I've been talking to a lot of black businesses around. I go up and talk to them and say, hey, look, you know what? You can go and you can add your business. It's a drop down menu and it's free. It's, it's an, the initial start of us expanding the paper in that way. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to go back to you two because making this deal was long and complicated, as Glenn has said, but it also involved a more personal <laughs> aspect of it because, as we know, all business is personal anyway, like politics. Um, and it turns out that Mel was um, more impressed with what you brought to the table, even though it was a good proposal, because he knew you were people of the community and he knew your families. Just a bit about that personal connection, Ron. Well, the first time we walked in to talk to Mel after sending in the proposal, he shocked both of us because he knew my family very well. He asked me if my father, who grew up in Canton, who's my grandfather, my father's father, Episcopal minister in Cambridge. He asked if my father still owned the farm that he grew up on, if my Aunt G. McGuire, you know, if we still had that property in the family. So I knew him and I knew that he had some, you know, some slight connection. He knew us well. He viewed me and my family and he understood that. And he was happy. I think we were from his tribe, as an easy way to put it. He had turned down multiple deers prior to our deal, and he turned them down, as I understand it, because he didn't feel those stewardship would be best for the community. He knew us. He knew where we came from. He knew our families, okay. and he understood our history, and I think that was important to him. Andre. He uh, said, I knew your grandfather, Doc Simmons, who worked at the Parker House, and he knew the Quarles family, who's another part of my family and actually dated a member of my family <laughs> and was quick to point that out. <laughs> so, I, so he knew So you. he knew me. Okay. <laughs> and that was very important. Um, Glenn, we've talked about uh, the importance of local ownership. Uh, I want to go back and just emphasize or have you articulate, because I think a lot of people listen to this discussion and say, why black owned? Why is that important at this time? Yeah, it means everything. It's, it's where the decisions are being made. It's where the influence comes from. And just to add a little bit to this, I think this is also a deal that was really crafted with black money. Mm -hmm. And so we're, you know, we're one of the first black, we are the first black CDFI in, in the state. And not only was it our resource that came to bear, but also there was other black business owners that stepped up uh, to make it happen. So I think also that also, I think, was an influence to Mel, too, of where the resource was coming to, to make it happen. Because mm -hmm. a lot of those times, that, that's where the strings are, are tied and, and some of the decisions happen behind the scenes. Um, yeah, look at, um, I think you know, Kylie, from my history here, it is, it is about ownership and how we kind of strengthen and build the assets in our community, because that's really what I would consider real power. And so this is an, this is an, this is an example of how we keep this narrative in our, you know, in, in, with, our, with our penmanship. Kind of moving forward. Just to be clear, there are some newspapers that are black targeted, but not black owned. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm saying this because I really want you all to articulate that difference and that importance. Now, Glenn has started. What would you add to that, Andre? I, I you know, I'm, I'm amazed every day, Callie, when people come up to me and they're just like, thank you to see black leaders owning this paper. They see, they read just like everybody else reads about the front of a paper and who's behind it. And they see a lot of papers being bought out um, and their local news diminishing. And people really want to know about what's happening in the black community. And they trust us and they will continue to come up to me and say, you know, thank you for taking the paper over because we see you two in front of it. We know who you are and we know it's a black business that we can trust. And, and as we go forward, we're gonna continue to expand our, our reach with all these different organizations and people. And you, Ron? Well, I think one of the most impressive things to me as we started to put the deal together was we understood what the CD, what Glenn's company was going to bring to the table and what support he had. But there was definitely a gap. And Andre and I went out and we spoke with many, many prominent African Americans in Massachusetts requesting support. And they came to the table big time. Financial you know, support. Financial support. Mm -hmm. You know, we received a very, you know, about a third of our about a third of the funding came from individual investors mm. who purchased shares in the new company so that we could make this happen. So it was a combination of, you know, our support, our efforts, Glenn's company, Mill City's efforts, and then this whole group, you know, of some 30 private investors, all African American, who said, we want this to continue, we want this voice, we want the, to have the, this voice continue, and we want it to be black owned, and we want it to represent us and, and our people. Mm -hmm. And that was the key. 
for us. You know, it really took it over the top and made us feel good and let me know that my efforts were, were I was right where I was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't start, go, I didn't, when this process started in the very beginning, I wasn't like, oh yeah, this is what I need to do. But as soon as I realized it was possible and I started to kick the tires on it, I brought Andre in and we started looking at what's possible and talking with the folks, the support that we got from the community was overwhelming. And that really just told me that was right where I was supposed to be. What will success look like for you and, and will you feel that fulfills Mel's legacy? Well, success for us, I mean, we have some very serious plans for this paper. Along with our research, as you had spoken about early on, a lot of black papers in the country, even though there are still 200, there were many, many more. Mm -hmm. Connecticut, mm -hmm. Rhode Island had black papers. New Hampshire had black papers, and I believe there was even one in Maine and even one in Vermont. Mm -hmm. Right now, they're all gone. One of our main expansion models mm -hmm. is that we're gonna do a Connecticut version. We're gonna do a Rhode Island version. We're gonna do one version for North of Massachusetts. Because all of those communities, all those African American communities, they no longer really have a voice. Their stories really aren't told in a way that, you know, the community wants them to be told. So our process over the next three or four months is to create those bureaus down there and to expand to those markets and do a version for those communities. Okay. That will be success for us in growing our website, you know, as well. And we're going to continue. Right now we print 30,000 papers a week, over 400 drop sites. When we tell people that, they're shocked yeah. because they always thought, well, the print is, is shrinking. Mm. But like Andre was saying, I grew up with that paper in my house. Yeah. You go to church, it would be there. You go to the community center, it would be there. That is, you know, our legacy. That's Mel's legacy and it's our job to continue that okay. and to continue the print of it. Andre. Uh, Callie, you know, in doing our research that Ron was talking about, I got to talk to some people in Maine and uh, I didn't even know the president of the Maine Celtics, their G League team, was black person. I didn't either. Uh, now, the, now we know. It's <laughs> so breaking on news. basic black. <laughs> okay. And you know what he told me? He goes, man, there's a black pages up here in Maine. When are you coming up here? Mm -hmm. He goes, I've, I've lived here for 18 years. And, you know, nobody discusses us. And there's a lot of immigrant communities in these, in these other New England mm -hmm. towns, and they're growing exponentially, mm -hmm. and it's time that they want to be covered. And they're like, hey, you can be the conduit to us, to Boston. Even going to Cambridge, people are like, I, you know, where's my banner? I need it. Well, I live in Cambridge, so yeah, where's my banner? I it, need it. <laughs> that's right. I have it in the car, so okay. I'll bring it right in. Okay. Glenn. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think there's, I mean, there's two sides. There's, there's the innovation that you already see happening in the banner, mm -hmm. literally in the, in the first few months, and uh, it's very impressive. And to see uh, this team really take this platform and really push it. And the other side is that you have to do it within a business model that makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. So you got to be looking at your cash flow and, uh, you know, to your viewership there, you know, there's advertising potential. So, so how do we make sure that the revenue is coming in to match the the energy of the of the innovation? And I got to tell you, I, I think I think the banner has some really good days ahead of it. Mm. So now a little personal question. So when the deal was finalized, how did you just feel in that moment, Ron? Uh, excited, you know, scared, <laughs> energized, uh, proud, you know. I'd, I'd say a combination of all of those. And um, it's been a whirlwind three months, but, you know, um, I'm really happy with where we are. We have a great staff. Um, and I think we tell great stories, you know. And also talking with the Chamber of Commerce and understanding that there's a large business community that has made commitments of non, you know, white companies have made commitments and buying commitments. And it's nice to know that that commitment is out there and, you know, we're working with those companies to make sure that they have the opportunity to meet their commitment for spending with black companies and we're a conduit for that too. Okay, the moment of the sale, how did you feel? I, I felt <laughs> great and you know, I got two out of state calls when, when the paper was purchased. Uh, my cousin in Maryland and a really good friend in Vermont and I go, how, how in the world did you know this? We go, well, we were reading about it in one of the papers and I go, well, you're gonna start reading it about us in the <laughs> banner and both of them wanted subscriptions right then and there. Oh, wonderful. So that is, tells me that I I know that this is a potential to grow um, and grow and grow and grow and reach all these readers in a variety of ways. I mean, I, we were talking about how um, the youth of today don't use, don't read papers. Mm -hmm. But still, you know, you're talking about being in Cambridge. When you go into hair salons and you go into barbershops, people still are opening the banner and reading it. So we know that that part of the paper is, is always going to be there. But my son's 23. He sends me stories all the time on his phone, and we have to access and exploit that to the best of our ability to make sure that everybody can read the paper. And plus, we're going to end up having stories that they're going to see nationally. I know that's going to happen. So it sounds like there's, there's so much outreach you can do to bring in folks who would like to support, just didn't have access or knowledge at this point. 
So there's a whole untapped audience. That's right. Okay. And Glenn. Well, just just to be clear, there, there was a lot of cross teams that have, make this thing happen, from <laughs> legal to finance. And, I'm sure. And, I just... and, and it was not the least of the complicated. But I do want to call it one name in particular. Yeah. You know, Tony Rust on our team really helped drive this thing uh, to, to the goal line. So I want to say his name. And, and yeah, and I think for me it was... Uh, it was a it was a celebration, very short lived because you know what? It's it's now what's now next. It's work. <laughs> now it's what's next, yes. <laughs> but did you have a moment of exhilaration? Short celebration. <laughs> yeah, a short celebration. <laughs> okay. he, he celebrated more than that. He celebrated more. Than okay. That. Yes, yes. All right. Well, I thank you all for joining me. Uh, that's the end of our broadcast, the end of our show. Thank you for joining us. And now stay with us as we continue our conversation on our digital platforms, YouTube and Facebook. <laughs> I'm Callie Crossley, host of Under the Radar 89.7. We are on YouTube and Facebook with our post show continuing our discussion on the 60th, 60th anniversary of the March on Washington and the new Bay State banner. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention this great tribute uh, event that you all had for Mel Miller um, to really properly give him his community due. Everybody at the event was a uh, title on their badge, Friends of Mel, which I thought was a nice touch. Um, how did that come together and, and how did you feel it, it went? Uh, well, when we, you know, when we first purchased the paper, it was clear in our plans from the beginning that we had to give Mel his due. Right. We had to do something for him because for all the years that he sacrificed, you know, Harvard educated attorney, there were plenty of things that he could have done to make a lot more money mm -hmm. if that was his goal. But he stuck and stood in there for the community. So we wanted to have an opportunity and to provide the community an opportunity to thank him. So it was something we were committed to do. And as we put it together after three months of ownership, our team, Nia, uh, Nia Media and Lynn Duvalus and those folks who helped to put us together were like, there's no way you're going to be able to do that. That's mm -hmm. quick. We need more time. <laughs> you know, but we were committed to getting it done. And they think it was a great event. And I think he appreciated it. There were some wonderful people, you know, not just the politicians who spoke, but a lot of friends of his, like, he said friends of Mel from yeah, the beginning right. who knew him, who knew his struggle, who stood behind him and helped him move the paper forward over all those years. And I think he was touched by it. And that mm. was our real goal, just to say thank you to Mel. Mm. Let him know how much we appreciated what he sacrificed for the community, okay. for our community. You, you know, we had, we focused a lot in the paper about having historical stories. Mm. And we had a tribute to Mel issue that was one of the best sellers that we've ever had. Mm -hmm. And we realized going forward that having this event, it was going to be a culmination of all the, the uh, efforts and the people who were waiting, oh, geez, you know, I want to say goodbye to him. I haven't seen him for X number mm -hmm. of years. I used to write for the paper, if mm -hmm. not for only a year. And here's a chance that I get to say thank you. You know, he might have, he launched some careers. He got people to learn how to write better. And so it was a nice uh, event to have everybody say thank you to him. And I know he appreciated it. And his wife appreciated it, too. Yeah, and, and to be clear, mm -hmm. we don't charge for the paper. Right. So it, when when right. he said one of the biggest sellers, he means advertising. Oh, yeah, right. that's right. Advertising. That's we're, right. Not, we're not going to start charging exactly. the paper. The we're paper is free. Yeah. As, I'm going to circle back to that been. in just yeah, a yeah, second. Yeah. Glenn. I think it's fantastic. I think mm. it's fantastic. I think Mel, mm. is, he, he doesn't like to get be in the spotlight. He's been behind the scenes all these years. And it was also like it was like a homecoming, right? And, and there was also some storytelling there, too, that there's mm. some things that I didn't, you know, a lot of us didn't realize. So, so it was great to have that happening in the, in the backdrop, too. Yeah, there was a mix of people there. Um, your MC last night, it was from Channel 5, Jessica, uh, and uh, that she represents the new generation. And you've spoken a lot about moving in that direction and making sure that you're addressing that population that 
may not receive its news the same way that some of the older folks always have. So what are you doing to make sure more than just focusing on the stories? Are you hiring young people? What's happening there? Without mm -hmm. question. I mm -hmm. think what shocked me during the George Floyd era the most, I have two uh, young adult sons. One's a freshman, we're gonna be going into freshman in college and another's uh, uh, going to be going into his junior year. But when the George Floyd era happened and I had my two sons come to me and say, look, we're gonna go march, are you coming? You know, they were adamant about it. So it showed me, A, that they were receiving news, they were getting on their phone, they were understanding the, the politics of it, and they had personally cared about their future and understood what it meant and understood what pushing back on this type of racism meant for them personally. And for me, it was just a whirlwind that all these folks get their news a different way. And we have to continue to inform them because those are the warriors of the future. Mm -hmm. You know, all the civil rights movement that I grew up in, that my parents struggled for, they were young at the time. You know, it was yes. a movement that was driven by our youth, young mm -hmm. adults, teenagers, 20-somethings. We've got to be able to continue to inform them. Or if that message continues to get co-opted like it does in many news, you know, broadcast news mm -hmm. and, and other outlets, then, you know, that's how you get people who vote against their own best interests. Mm -hmm. You know, you look around the country and you go, how do people vote this way for things that don't benefit them? Mm -hmm. How do they vote against their own interests? Because they are misinformed. Because, you know, the news comes in a form of influencism. It's not journalism. Mm -hmm. And when you don't, in a vacuum, mm -hmm. then it's filled with garbage. And, and that's the challenge. So at that point, that was kind of my beginning to say, look, it's really important that we keep these young folks informed. It's, it's, it's vital. Okay, and, and who, do you, who do you see uh, taking over various roles, younger folks, in your new operation? We've had some younger writers mm -hmm. from Boston University and Northeastern who, you know, it, I don't want to say too much of this in this way, but it reminds me of me sometimes mm -hmm. when I got here and I go, wow, I want to try everything and work on everything and work long hours because I believe in the story. Mm -hmm. And we're hiring some people like that from both of those schools. And we want to keep that fresh voice who, who was willing to learn and willing to write for a paper like ours. And echoing what Ron said, you know, my son sends me all these different um, stories about different black entrepreneurs. There was one that Northeastern was making watches, and then he writes for a diaspora blog. And when they first started it, there are only 10 countries, and now there's 30 countries that he has for this, that people who go on Copley Square and they all get dressed up in their traditional garb from whatever country their families are from. And I go, wow, that's really impressive. Mm -hmm. And you can always learn from young people. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, we had a story about a TikToker who's worried about, who's, who's um, very innovative, but he's worried about what's going to happen if the government shuts him mm -hmm. down. Mm -hmm. And so stories like that resonate with young people. We want to keep churning that that um, that mixer mm -hmm. to make sure that we touch on those issues that are salient to them. And it's not only our writers. One of our biggest partners in the company is our digital sales manager, right. Colin Red, mm -hmm. and he's a young thirty-something guy who came over from Blavity, mm -hmm. you know, an expert in digital advertising, an expert in understanding how you package that digital message. And he's crucial in the way that we are reaching out to younger people. He helps. Oh, he helped redesign our website. He helps reaching out uh, in our digital advertising space, in our digital marketing space. And then also our public relations firms, Nia Media. Half of their team is 30-somethings as well. So it's the Facebook, it's the Twitter, it's the Snapchat. It's all of those different things. We're packaging up little versions of the stories. We're sending them out. So a lot of our management team, you know, as far as our marketing mm -hmm. and, uh, and a, lot of, a lot of our management team is those 30-something folks who, again, have, uh, who, are, who are seasoned in it, who have been doing it for, you know, even though they're 30, 31, 32, they've still been in the business for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And they understand it and they live it. You know, Andre and I, we're cresting, you know, a lot older than that. <laughs> right, okay. You know, and, um, and it was a learning curve for us, so right. we're really honored to have them as part of our team. And the good news is they understand the importance of the message. You know, they are smart people who understand the media landscape and they know that what we're doing, bringing these real stories to the forefront and they appreciate how we want to reach them, how we're reaching out our, you know, as Andre said, we have a lot of younger writers. Right. You know, we make sure in our paper there are stories that appeal to those younger writers. Now, are you worried about, you know, turning off some of your traditional audience, your older audience? 
No, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I think that, um, you know, I, I got a call the other day, and it's really funny. Uh, Tuesday's production day, Wednesday you take a breath, and then Thursday everybody calls complaining about certain things. <laughs> <laughs> and I got a call from uh, somebody about a story, and he goes, one of our staffers saw it online. I go, you know what that means? They were probably 25. Yeah. And they saw it. <laughs> so that, that resonates with me yeah. because I know that they're <laughs> reading it, and they're um, dispensing the information to their superiors or their co-workers, <laughs> okay. let's say. Don't say superiors. But, okay. um, so I know that there are a lot of people who are, who are watching that. The other thing is... So, you still, so you're maintaining cross-generational appeal. I, I Absolutely. Just, just jump yes, in, please. too. I think yeah. that what was great with Andre and, and Ron is they pulled a really unique team, diverse team together, and of age, too, right? So mm -hmm. you have a Ken Cooper on one side, mm -hmm. I think for journalistic quality, you know, you know, we know Pulitzer Prize, uh, Prize winner. Probably, yeah. And mm -hmm. um, and the Colin Red that you mentioned earlier, right? So I do think that you guys have really pulled together uh, a smart team that crosses across the generation. And I'll also quickly say that you know, they come from audio, the audio video side of the equation. Yeah. I think that's the direction where media is heading. So with their backgrounds, I think media is there. Media is there. <laughs> yeah. Media right. there. Yeah. From, from yeah. the yeah. print, I'm sorry, right. from the print news side. Mm -hmm. But I think yeah. that's the, that's yeah. another yeah. Uh, positive background uh, piece from these guys. The the other oh. thing is that the Boston, the Boston landscape is a very very intelligent landscape. Mm -hmm. We have some of the smartest readers, just overall in the state, highly educated, and I don't think, though we get complaints about this and that. I believe that the older reader appreciates that younger voice. Mm -hmm. They're smart. They understand the importance of it. They understand the legacy of it. They understand that their kids need to have that same care for the community that they had. Mm -hmm. And they want their younger kids to have a resource to get that information. You know, so I think that we're not really turning off the older readers. I think they actually like it. I, th I think it's a refreshing change. Um, the paper did have some younger stuff in it before, but now we're really but working really hard to make sure that there's a balance. You know? So I just want to, because for people who are unaware, the paper is free, um, and so that means you have to support it in other ways, and the advertising is an important piece of it. And as we know, we've seen so many uh, reports about how little black media actually gets from some of these corporations that who normally their media buy budget is quite large in other uh, white owned media, just to be clear. So how are you all working? Uh, Glenn, I can start with you to try to get gin that up. Yeah, well, I, I think, you know, since the George Floyd issue, there's there's uh, been more mandated spend requirements mm -hmm. that we have to see from the corporate side. So we got but we you could say that, but then you got to put pressure on people. So right. I do think that there's there's market for that type of advertising. And then there's just utility marketing. Like they, there's markets that we reach, eyeballs that we that we reach that folks need to be fully leveraging uh, through the banner. So I do think uh, you know, those are two areas that I think we're we're pushing for. It's wonderful to be in the room, you know, most recently I sat down with Jim Rooney, uh, Chamber of Commerce, mm -hmm. and Jim was talking about the new commitments that all these major corporations have to spend with black companies. Mm -hmm. And he shared the challenge. He said, Ron, it's actually true that many of them have the desire to do it, but it's hard in the industry to find enough black companies that they can spend their money on to meet their commitment. Mm -hmm. And your type of company, a newspaper, advertising, provides that opportunity for them. So when you're in that room with those folks and they're talking about incrementalism and you know we can work it out and we can grow to a larger budget remind them that they have this commitment and you're an opportunity for them to meet that commitment mm -hmm. so you know there's, it's there's an another revenue thing. stream that you guys haven't mentioned yet which I believe you, your new team is looking at is, is events right mm. so so mm. you know you look you mentioned El Mundo was referenced uh, last night uh, um, so yeah I think that's another uh, vehicle where I think the new banner leadership is trying to push for yeah, yeah. Um, and actually if you look around locally people may uh, associate that Boston, the Boston Globe is now into a lot of events. Washington Post, they do a lot of events. So if you have a newspaper-based event, that's uh, done very well in many other parts of the country. So last word from any of you all as we wrap up. Your last word? Your last well, word? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the last one. word is, is uh, you, 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 I'm glad that we're being introduced to the, the, new, the new and exciting innovative leadership of the, of the banner and, uh, you know, pick up the paper, uh, you know, make sure you call for an advertisement uh, as, as, we, as we read the great stories. That's right. We are focusing on um, economic empowerment, racial justice, and political empowerment. And those three things resonate within the community, and they always will continue to resonate community. You were talking about the 60th anniversary of the March on Washington. Those are three basic tenets so that the paper holds true and that <coughs> we learned from the, the March on Washington. Okay. My last word would be that 
we all know Mel's commitment to our community. It was unyielding. You know, sometimes it was so strong that people didn't understand it. Mm -hmm. And you know, and, and, he, and he brushed, he ruffled feathers because he was unyielding in his commitment. And I think that Andre and I have learned that in our three months that we have to be unyielding in that commitment. It is important and you can't be swayed by this or that. You gotta stand in the breach. You gotta be that person like, you know, Ayanna Presley and many of our new politicians, you know, there's a firestorm coming our way. Mm -hmm. And it's up to us, us, as black people, black Americans, to stand up and demand that equality that we've been fighting for, as you said, for mm -hmm. over, over 400 mm -hmm. years, you know? So I'm honored to be in that, in that position and I'm willing to take on this challenge with the team that we've created. It's our responsibility, it's, it's no one else is gonna do it, you know? If not now, when, if not us, who? Okay, well, thanks a lot for the conversation and we look forward to seeing what's coming next for the Bay State Banner. Ha, ha, ha.